we're going to be talking about the internet, a tool for communication and for the sending of pictures of cats. So we know from our studies on analog and digital signals that analog signals can lose fidelity when they're transmitted long distances. They can become distorted by interference, leading to pictures like this on a TV. So this can make the signal unrecognizable. In the worst case, it can reduce the signal to static, which is just random data without any form. So for this reason, instead of using analog data, we tend to use digital information for transferring. And the reason is that it's harder to lose fidelity with a digital recording when you're transmitting. Sure, you've lost a bit of fidelity because you now have a digital signal instead of an analog one. But once you have the digital signal, its fidelity shouldn't really change much when you transmit it. The internet provides a way of transmitting digital data very quickly and all over the world using the telephone communications. So we have a huge network of computers connected by things like ethernet cables, telephone wires, and optical fiber cables, which of course we learned about when we were talking about total internal reflection. And we can also use things like wireless communications to get things like satellite links. Computers, in order to talk to each other or communicate with each other, use a series of protocols like the hypertext transfer protocol. So these allow the computers to request information from each other in a certain way and to send that information back in a certain way. It's a little bit like a language of computers speaking to each other or a series of steps that they go through in order to get information from each other. The protocols will tend to allow for corrupt data because even though analog signals tend to be more affected by interference, digital signals can be affected by interference too. But computers are able to detect whether a digital signal is good and working fine or bad and has been interfered with. And if it receives a bad signal when it's been corrupted by interference, it can send back a request to send that signal again. And it can keep doing this until it gets an uncorrupted version of the signal. That's exactly the same as the signal that you started off with. Computers use a modem, which might look something like this, in order to turn the digital signals of the computer information into analog signals, which can be sent through phone lines. Consequently, because phone lines are controlled by telephone companies, a lot of the internet plans that you can get are also associated with big phone companies. Now in the past, if you wanted to connect to the internet, you had to send the digital signals straight to a modem, and the modem would turn them into sound information, which would then be sent through telephone lines. We can see here an old handset from a telephone placed on top of a modem, so that the sounds that the modem produces are sent straight through the phone lines. This technology we grew out of pretty fast, and by the 80s and 90s, we had small modem devices which acted like a modem and a phone at the same time. All you needed to do was disconnect your ordinary phone and put the modem in instead. So this is what we call a dial-up connection. If you're using a dial-up connection, it sort of replaces your telephone connection, and information is sent through that set of signals. So the telephone companies would charge the user based on how long the telephone call was, except rather than being a telephone call to someone else to speak to them, it would be a telephone, well, a modem call rather than a telephone call to an internet service provider who would then send back the information that was requested. Today, though, we don't use dial-up. We use broadband connections, and the setup for a broadband connection might look something like this. You can see that the phone is still working and operational right next to the modem. If we have a broadband connection, it means that we can use both the phone and the modem at the same time, which I'm sure you'll agree is very convenient. Instead of being charged for the length of a call, because the modem can be always on, we're instead charged for the amount of data that is sent and received through the connection. So if you go to your computer and you type in a web page like Google, for example, then your computer will send a signal to the computer that has Google on it, which might be thousands of kilometers away on, somewhere on the other side of the world. And so that's given here by the request arrow coming out of the laptop. So the server will receive the request, process it using a protocol, perhaps the hypertext transfer protocol. And based on what the request has in it, it will take the web pages that it contains and send a response. So both the request and the response will go through many different devices. It's not just a simple connection plugging in one computer to the Google computer. Otherwise, that's not really the internet, is it? It's a local area network. So if we want to send something to Google, we need to send a signal across the internet. And that means that we're going to have to take many more steps than just this. So first of all, the data is sent to your modem. 
and converted to a signal that can be sent through telephone lines. So it'll travel through the phone lines until the signal reaches your ISP, that is, internet service provider. That's the person who you pay for, for internet. Once it's reached that, it'll travel through a whole bunch of carriers. Carriers are simply devices which will receive a request for a web page and then pass that request on. So it sort of carries the signal onto the next part of the network. We can see here a trace of how far a signal is moving. Most of these entries in the middle are the signal passing through various different carriers. Right at the bottom here, it starts to reach carriers close to its destination. Finally, once the signal arrives at the destination, the server that it arrives at can interpret the signal, figure out what to send back, and then send that response. Once the response gets back to the computer in the same way that the requests went, the modem will translate the signal into computer-readable data. This will consist of ones and zeros, which can then be translated into letters, for example, as we can see at the top here. And a browser, something like Mozilla Firefox or Google Chrome, is a program on your computer which can turn this raw text and ones and zeros data into formatted data, that is, data that looks nice and pretty. Something like this picture on the bottom, with a proper font and color and backgrounds and images and things like that. So that's the end of the theory. Uh, in this section, we've covered exactly what the internet is and a little bit about how it works.